religion just like we have for centuries. And Ann Coulter came back and said, well, that translation of that means let all the Muslims in. He's, she said uh, Trump should deport Nikki Haley. And of course, that's the problem. Nikki Haley doesn't understand or appreciate our history. She doesn't understand or appreciate our culture. She's made that abundantly clear as governor of South Carolina. Uh, she's exhibit B with Obama being exhibit A of why it is important to have people who are natural born citizens who have lived here in this country for a while who uh, like and love the con the uh, history and the culture of this country. It's important to have that in. Again, we see that the founders who created this country are far wiser than the politicians that we have today. It's another reason why I disagree with the idea of a constitutional convention. We do not want uh, this bunch of uh, puppets rewriting the Constitution. Although that's what they're doing right now on the stage. They're rewriting the Constitution. Right. Just ignore it. I like Chris Christie, but we cannot afford to have a president of the United States that supports Common Core. We cannot <clears> afford to have a president of the United States that supports... And we just saw the report from uh, Project Veritas, where they were talking to the people of Common Core, saying that, no, it's just a big scam to get people yeah. to buy textbooks. Well, what they should be upset about is Ronald Reagan was right. Candidate Ronald Reagan was right when he ran in 1980. Jimmy Carter had created the Department of Education to centralize control of education. And it was less than four years old. Ronald Reagan said he was going to dismantle it. He could have killed that monster in the cradle, but instead it was about eight times bigger, if memory serves me correctly, uh, when he got finished. He left it there and continued to grow it exponentially. And now we have the situation where we're fighting over what curriculum is going to be shoved down our throat at the national level. We need to get rid of the Department of Education, but they won't talk about that anymore. You don't even have a candidate who will say what Ronald Reagan said when he was running in 1980. Of course, Ronald Reagan didn't do it, and that's why we're having this conversation about Common Core today. Planned Parenthood. Our next president and our Republican nominee cannot be someone who supports those positions. Governor? <laughs> hmm. Gotta agree with him on that. I stood on the Gun control, Marco Planned Parenthood, yeah. hmm? Common Core. And so yeah. Someone told you that because we're running for the same office, that criticizing me will get you to that office. It uh, how dare you point yeah. out <laughs> my hypocrisy within the party. How <laughs> dare you. Baron von Heineken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> set the facts straight. First of all, I didn't support Sonia Sotomayor. Secondly, I never wrote a check to Planned Parenthood. Third, if you look at my record as governor of New Jersey. That was Jeb Bush. Oh, that's right. It was Jeb Bush that finally vetoed. <laughs> Jeb's over there like, oh, don't. Yeah, don't drag me into this. <laughs> don't mention the fact that my daddy and my granddaddy were uh, at the top of Planned Parenthood. Right. And I said, oh, well, I cut off state funding of $300,000 in Florida. But meanwhile, Jeb's in a foundation. Looks like in 1994 he donated to Planned Parenthood. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that foundation he was part of that he said, oh, we were just pushing Common Core with Bill Gates. Uh, they donated $10 million to uh, Planned Parenthood as a foundation that he was uh, head of. Uh, but then he says, oh, I cut, cut funding by cutting $300,000. So he gives them 30 times the amount that he cuts from the state funding. The last piece is this. I like Marco, too. And two years ago, he called me a conservative reformer that New Jersey needed. That was before he was running against me. Now that he is, he's changed his tune. I'm never going to change my tune. I like Marco Rubio. He's a yeah. good guy. He's always going to push the war on drugs. Yeah. <laughs> He's always going to threaten states he to have decriminalized marijuana. He did change his tune, tune on gun control. Didn't he just come out yeah, the other day and say, oh, yeah, he well, says now he's I evolving would. on gun control. And yeah, now yeah. I'm okay with it. Except, except. You're not going to, he's not going to allow the Second Amendment to get in the way of safety. That's what he said. Uh. You know, I'm all for public safety, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that be interpreted that way. And I think the focus ought to be. I'm going to put liberty ahead of safety. Leave this nomination process as wild and woolly as it's going to be. This is not bean bag. These attack ads are going to be part of life. Everybody just needs to get used to it. Everybody's record's going to be. I'm going to attack uh, Marco Rubio for being short. I'm going to say he's wearing boots Rubio's with dancing heels. shoes. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm going to say when I'm questioning, out, I don't have a height issue. Let's talk about <laughs> fantasy football. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. And it's not Hillary Clinton you need to unite against now. Now it's Bernie Sanders. Mm hmm. And so everybody's feeling the burn and you guys are just rubbing it in. And he actually does want to talk about fantasy football, as you can see on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Regulate it.
<laughs> well, he wants to pretend that he's all, you know, we're not going to speak any evil of Republicans while he's digging the knife in everybody's back as soon as he can. I mean, what a hypocrite. You know, we, and when I Childish hypocrite Republicans Jeb is. Tore themselves apart. You know, we have to stop this because, you know, if we manage to damage ourselves and we lose the next election and a progressive gets in there and they get two or three Supreme Court picks, this nation is over as we know it. And we got to look at the big picture here. See, that's a problem, too, because we never the Supreme Court gave itself the in Marbury versus Madison, the right to be the supreme decider of everything. That's not the way this is supposed to work. As Jefferson and others said, we have a divided uh, government for a reason. Let's go to Richard Reeves in South Carolina. Richard. Hey, David, thanks. Uh, well, put in reverse for a little bit. Uh, earlier, the discussion was about the Goldman Sachs loan and the Citibank loan for Ted Cruz, which uh, really it came up in a, an interview we did earlier with uh, an attendee of the debate named Stephen that was talking about that there's just such a desperate need for campaign finance reform. You know, because what we've got right now is a system set up where if you want to run for a Senate seat, you probably need multi-millions of dollars to run and be able to win a Senate seat right now. If you want to run for a House seat, you probably need at least seven figures, at least one or two million for a House seat. So even for city council, even for county commissioner, you, you need hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases to run for these seats. So what do we expect? What do we expect for these guys to have to do to even be able to run? Of course it corrupts them. So we need serious campaign finance reform. Uh, we don't want to step on the First Amendment when we do it, but there's got to be some way nowadays to be able to do it with people to be able to set up their websites with uh, maybe uh, somehow some, some simple qualification process for candidates to submit to run for races, and then they're allotted a certain amount of money to uh, run with, and this is what you run with. So, you know, we got to not step on the First Amendment, but at the same time, the way the campaign finance system works right now is just it's just like starlets that go to Hollywood and they want to go and be in movies. Well, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be on that casting couch. And so this is the political version of that. Well, for a long time, elections have been an advanced auction of stolen goods. That's what H.L. Minkin called it. I think you yes. or, or uh, Mark Twain. Anyway, whoever said it, that's true. OK. But I think, Richard, the problem is not uh, to limit the First Amendment of, of people. I think uh, campaign finance reform with artificial limits is really going to result in uh, the same people who basically keep third party candidates off the stage at the debates, even though they're qualified to be on the ballot. I've been with third party uh, politics uh, a lot, and I've seen that even though we qualified for the ballot, we were never allowed to be in the debates, whether you're talking about local elections or whether you're talking about state governor elections or whether you're talking about uh, congressional or presidential elections. We were always excluded, even though we were on the ballot. So I have absolutely no confidence that if we have campaign finance reform, that it's going to be a fair shake. I think they're going to keep people from getting access to, they're going to use it as a way to control access. I think the problem with what we're seeing here is that we've got too much power concentrated in Washington. And like a black hole, it is sucking in corruption and it is sucking in dollars. And people know that they can uh, get a 5,000% uh, return on their investment very easily by buying off a politician who will then turn a contract over to them. Mm -hmm. And that happens at every level of government. At the lowest level of government, of course, the, the crooked game is real estate. You get people in uh, city council and you can uh, get them to condemn uh, or rezone things so that you can get stuff passed in real estate. And then when you get up to uh, Washington, everything is on the table. So the problem is the power in Washington. We have to uh, it, we have to use checks and nullification in Washington. And as long as we got candidates like Ben Carson just said when he came on here, we have to be concerned about who's going to be appointed to the Supreme Court. We need to start looking at ways to contain the Supreme Court instead of giving them omnipotent power and saying we're going to have. Uh, a, uh, a dictator who's going to appoint people to the Supreme Court. I think the problem is there's too much concentration of power in Washington, frankly. Mm. Well, there's no question about that. But, you know, you're talking about that, well, if we had campaign finance reform, that they would block third parties. Well, I think they've been thoroughly successful in blocking yes. third parties already. Yes. So that's not the question. I think the last, the biggest third party candidate I remember winning a race in the recent uh, past was Joe Lieberman, and we really know how third party he really is. Uh, you know, that's a total joke. Yeah, so, it is. It is. Uh, something's got to change in that regard. Absolutely, the power of the concentration in Washington is vastly uh, 
just overwhelming. But the thing of it is, is we've got low-hanging fruit here, folks. I know at a personal level that the low-hanging fruit is being able to take over the Republican National Committee, being able to take over the GOP, fill it up with patriots, and then guess what? We can have good candidates on at least one half of the ballot right there. I agree with you, Paul. I agree with you. I think, uh, Richard, that getting people in at the state level, because part of the problem, and what we're doing it tonight, is you cover the races that are national, that are the top level. Those are the glamorous races. Those are the ones that everybody pays attention to. But the things where we could really make a difference, as you're pointing out, is getting involved in local politics. That's where you can really take it over at right. a grassroots level, and we don't. And one of the reasons we don't is because we get so distracted with these fake presidential elections. And that's the real sad thing about and it. And that is part of the plan. Well, the good thing about the fake presidential elections is it could bring in these new people, these new fired up info warriors and patriots that we need to take over at the grassroots level. Because if they take over at the political atomic level, which is the precinct level, if they take over at that level, then guess what? We can start influencing races from dog catcher the president yes. and the presidential yes. race will not be fake anymore. It'll be for real. Because uh, as, as we'll see, as we talked about earlier, 168 RNC members, you couldn't even get uh, a vote to uh, impeach Obama with 168 RNC members. Well, I've been involved in this stuff long enough to know that there is absolutely no reason those 168 RNC members right now could be all be ousted in 2016. They could be ousted this election cycle if our people just show up to their caucuses and conventions and go through the process and most I agree, Richard. info warriors don't we don't know that but <laughs> you know what there's good people in the system that have learned to work it the fact that a resolution for impeachment even came up for discussion period at all I agree. is a fracture in the dam that I shows agree. that the dam is about to burst and it just the question is I'm Richard, we're going to let you there, finish Richard. up after yeah, the break we're going to come back after break, break. Right they're on break and we need to take a break right now come back Welcome back to our live coverage here at InfoWars with a live analysis and commentary of the sixth GOP debate. They've just come back from break and they're talking about gun control, saying, well, it was right here in Charleston that Dylan Roof uh, killed everybody. I think it's kind of interesting. They should ask him, say, well, we're here in Charleston. What about Charleston Heston uh, <laughs> that you said uh, gave you this award and he completely made it up and... <laughs> <laughs> of course, he had to. He didn't uh, give his, him a gun. His campaign had to take that back and say, well, no, actually, uh, Jeb misspoke. Let's go back real quickly to uh, Richard Reeves in South Carolina. Richard, you were talking about campaign finance reform. I agree with what you had to say. I think we need to get involved at the local level. It can make a big difference in both national politics in the long, time as, uh, in the long term, as well as uh, putting a bulwark against uh, federal uh, intrusion into state and local government if we have the right people in office. David, you're right. I mean, if theoretically each individual got busy in their precinct and just found 10 neighbors, find 15 neighbors, they could go back and get a list of primary voters from the Republican elections in 2008. They could get one from 2012. And with that list, they can find the Ron Paulers if they, they can do a little extrapolation. They can find their fellow Ron Paulers in their neighborhoods. If they gathered up I'm serious, David. If they only gathered up 10 or 15 of their neighbors in each precinct in each of these United States, done deal. GOP would be Patriot. We could rename it the Patriot Party, David. I agree. I agree. I think people need to get involved at the local level. There's a lot we can do. Let's go back to the debate. Thank you, Richard. Uh, let's hear Donald Trump's uh, answer to uh, gun control. Here's what he has to say. What is going on? We have to protect our Second Amendment, and you cannot do this, and certainly what Barack Obama was doing with the executive order. He doesn't want to get people together, you know, the old-fashioned way where you get Congress. You get the Congress, you get the Senate, you get together, you do legislation. <laughs> you do legislation. The yeah, the old-fashioned way, you know, as if the Constitution mattered. Right, yeah. but he doesn't. He wants a little yeah. pen and phone. I mean, let's just, let's just call it that. Let's call it the Constitution, but of course we can't have that discussion. Uh, the Constitution is old-fashioned and not appropriate if it gets in your way. And that's basically the approach of uh, Barack Obama and the approach of Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio if it gets in the way of their getting to be president. Right, didn't Barack Obama call it just a piece of paper? Yeah. The other day? It's not an option. It's not self-enforcing, that's Over for sure. a piece of paper. Of every American to be able to protect themselves and their families. 
I am convinced that if this president... And to resist a tyrannical government. But, of course, he won't say that. Okay. <laughs>